All right, good afternoon, everybody. Hopefully you can hear me. Uh, this, I'm not used to leaning in like this. This is kind of awkward, but uh, I'll try to speak as loud as I can uh, as I present this information to you. My name is Michael Warren. I'm with the Alcohol, Tobacco, Tax, and Trade Bureau. Uh, I work out of the formulation office. Um, and my colleague here is Kayori Flores. She works in the labeling office as the assistant director from Home uh, So we're going to get this thing started. Um, this is the agenda. I'll try to stick to the agenda. If you have questions, you can stop me at any time because this is kind of for you guys. So if you got a question, say, hey, Mike, stop. I don't get it. Or can you elaborate on that? Just let me know. Um, so we are, we're going to get into the agenda. It's going to be an introduction, of course, formulas, labels, and then we'll have uh, some time for questions at the end, um, hopefully. Uh, this is a disclaimer. So whatever I present today, Essentially, I'm not trying to change any regulations, or if I misspeak, it does not impact the legality of our regulations. So don't take what I say as the gospel. However, if you need the information from the regs, that's where you need to go to confirm what I'm actually stating to you guys. So it's just a disclaimer information, just in case I misspeak. All right, we're gonna get in the formula side of the house. Um, we're gonna commonly, common, Formula questions, what is a formula? Why is a formula required? At what stage do I apply for a formula? When is a formula required? How do I apply for a formula? All right, so basically a form, formula is just, it's kind of like a recipe. Basically what you guys will have, you'll, you'll submit, submit a recipe to my office. Specialists will review the recipe um, and it must include quantitative list of ingredients, uh, method of manufacture, um, total yield of the product, and in some instances, you'll require a lab analysis. So it, it essentially should, you should, I should be reading a, a recipe from a cookbook, so to speak. So I should be able to replicate your product in my office, it's technically speaking. I don't always get formulas that way, and I'll push back a little bit, because everything should be quantitative in nature. So if you have an ingredient listed, it should have some sort of quantity associated with it. And you can submit it by percentages as well. So, if you need some additional information on, on this, you can see formula basics on our TTV webpage. Uh, where's the formula requirement? This is just the, the sites that actually give us the authority to request formulas from you guys uh, or recipes. Uh, so, we have domestic, we receive domestic and imported formulas. Uh, and these are just the regulatory sites uh, that where we have the authority to receive formulas that information for guys. And the other thing, uh, while I'm on that, uh, a lot of times if a formula is required, many brewers think, I guess, because uh, I get a lot of questions about this, that um, if I only produce, if I only uh, uh, move my product interstate, do I need to submit a formula? Why do I need to submit a formula? Technically, you do. That only applies to the labeling side of the house. So formula requirements, if there is a formula requirement for, for your product that you're producing, doesn't matter if you're just producing in New York, I mean, just you know distributing in New York, still the formula requirement still kicks in. Labeling does not, but the formula requirement remains in play, be it interstate or intrastate. And I get that question constantly. So. And uh, go ahead. So what? You see, certain products, what qualifies for you to submit this formula on the beer side? Oh, we're going to get into that. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're going to get into that. Yeah, good question. We're going to get there. We're going to get there. <laughs> Why is a formula required? So, technically, what we do is we look at the formula for tax purposes and labeling purposes. Uh, also, we're looking at, looking at it for the ingredients that you're using. You could be using, well, we won't say you could be. Possibly, you could be using an additive that's unauthorized or a prohibited ingredient. We look for those things in the formula to ensure that you know, you're know you not putting anything bad out there, so to speak. Um, also, some things are limited. So there are some additives that are okay, like propylene glycol or something to that effect. You may use that in your formula, but it has limitations. So we look for the limitations in your, in your product to make sure you're still within the FDA guidelines for those particular additives that you're using. Um, also, if it's a formulated product, typically you're gonna have an SOC requirement. So you'll have a statement of composition that's required to appear on the label. And what we'll do is we'll give you a suggested SOC, suggested statement of composition. And that's a suggested statement. So if you wanna deviate from the statement slightly, you can, but you can't move away from it where the truthfulness of the statement is 
is not what we actually intended when we when we gave that to you. So you can actually deviate from it. You can say malt beverage with natural flavors or malt beverage with strawberry puree. Same as you're saying, pretty much the same statement, but you have the option of using either in that case. All right, at what stage do I apply for formula approval? Domestically, you apply for your formula approval before you start producing your beer, prior to the production of your An imported a formula approval may be requested prior to or in conjunction with your label application, so you can submit them both at the same time. That's the difference between the two. Is anybody doing any kind of importing? Importation? No? Okay. Um, so here's to, this is to your question. So when is a formula required? Typically formulas are required when you're using flavors uh, with alcohol present. And flavors with alcohol present, typically they go through our lab, but we'll get into that as well. Um, compounded flavors, those are the ones that go through the lab, but you could have a vanilla extract, which doesn't, it, doesn't really have to go through the lab, and that would be a flavor with an alcohol that does not have to go through the lab. But typically, compounded flavors, raspberry flavors that make use of, uh, like I said, flavor components, propylene glycol, vanillin, and all these sort of things. Typically, they're purchased from a flavor house, like Flavormatic, uh, Gibbon, and those are some big companies. Uh, if your beer has colors, that's going to require for uh, artificial sweeteners, like Superlows, Cesophane K. Um, aspartame, all of those are artificial sweeteners, and if you're actually including those into your beer, it's gonna kick in the formula requirement. Food materials, um, unless exempted, well, yeah, we have an exempt list under our uh, TTB ruling 2015-1. If you're using food materials like um, uh, chocolate, cocoa, that, I think those are exempt, but if you decide to use some exotic type uh, flavors um, that, Oh. <laughs> I don't want to get that. No, we're not doing it. But um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of an odd uh, flavor. Like, yeah, the exotic fruits. But no, because some of these fruits, I, I won't say dragon that. Fruit? Dragon fruit, that's not on the list, right? No. Okay, so dragon fruit. So dragon fruit would not be a part of that exempt list. Uh, like certain things on the list are like, like I said, cocoa nibs, um, <laughs> apples, I don't know. That sort of thing, common things. But when you start deviating from it and you use some exotic Asian fruit that's not on that list, formula will kick in. So that, that's kind of where that goes. And if you're actually uh, producing ice beer, and that's when the ice crystals, you freeze it, ice crystals are removed, but subsequently add it back to the beer. A lot of times, brewers don't add that ice back to the beer. And if you don't, it's considered freeze distillation. So if you're actually producing a beer, you remove the ice crystals to concentrate the alcohol content, and you don't add that, you remove the crystals and not add it back, it's a distilled spirit at that point, and you're not a beer. So you need a DSP brewer, then you have it. <laughs> so, so yeah, so if you, if you start doing those type of processes, yeah, that, that would be a, it will, it will require a formula, and if it comes to us and you didn't put the added crystals back, we'll probably push back and say, hey, you're making a spirit, uh, you can't produce it this way, and we want you to adjust that for me. Any other questions? Any questions about that? None? Go ahead. Um, the 2015-1, does that get updated regularly, or has it been updated recently to include, because I know for sure this expanded count of things that we're using? No, that's a good question. Uh, the funny thing is, they are now, uh, we're, we're working on that document, so it's actually stuck, I don't know if it's stuck in council or our rules and regulations division, but it's a series of ingredients that we actually requested that they add to that list. I don't know, it may be up with 20, 20 ingredients. Yeah, there's also, um, a, the Brewers Association submitted a petition to TTB, and um, we're working with other divisions in the agency to sort of address those. So they, they asked for, I believe it was 11 ingredients, and then yeah. of course we're gonna be adding our own in the agency. Um, so that's gonna go through, you know, routing, review, and stuff like that. But it hasn't been updated um, since 2015, since, so this will be the first. Since yeah. the yeah. updated. Well, 2014, then 2015, and then now. Yeah. It's be like uh, six, seven years? Yeah. It's been that, six, yeah. yeah. So it'll be the first update in a while. Yeah. If you had to forecast, how long do you think it will take to get through the process? I don't want to lie to you. I don't want to lie to you. I don't want to lie to you. We can't project. It's really hard because it has to go through like legal review and stuff. But um, basically, you know, because a petition was submitted, 
you know, optically speaking, like, the agency doesn't want to sit on it for three years because, like, we're like, you submitted a petition, like, a decade ago, like, now we're, so we, we, we try our best to be, like, from a customer service standpoint, try to respond timely, and I would imagine I'd be, like, one calendar year, like, minimum, you know. But, but they'll be happy about it because, like I said, the, with the Craft Brewers Association, um, actually requested 11. We have much more than that that's on that list. So whenever it's uh, released, it'll, it'll be, it'll, it'll be, they'll be happy about it, but it is taking some time to get it out. So, so if you're not having any of those adjuncts listed or colors or anything, you're just doing traditional style. Straight ahead beer. And in that in that 2015-1-1, there is an attachment that specifies specifies the ingredients that are exempt. So honey, vanilla beans, and barrel aging. I, I may get into the barrel aging issue uh, a little later, uh, but that's always a bit dicey uh, because the in industry circuit 2015-1 states that any type of wood contact with beer is okay. But we do have a relationship with the FDA if you're using an exotic wood in the production of your beer, we'll run that through the FDA as well just to make sure that that wood doesn't have any uh, components that could be dangerous or not, not you know, suitable for food use. So, uh, because it's, it is an extraction process. You're just not, it's not a food, food contact surface item. You're actually extracting flavors from that wood. So we do have to check that with the FDA. Yeah. Any other questions? I'm sure. Do you with the federal or state government? Federal. And so if we're state, uh, these rules, are you aware? There should be common, most states have common law, common laws associated with our laws. And some states actually adopt our laws almost verbatim. So it just depends on what state. States vary from, again, they just vary. Uh, but most, most states, well, a lot of them do adopt our laws almost, uh, you know, verbatim. So the formula is required in New York to well, yes, yeah. If, if it's required in New York, yeah, you would have to submit it to New York State as well. But yeah, and I think too with the labels, the, do they? Re if, if if we require a cola with us, they act, they don't accept our cola. How does that? Do? Don't get into that. Okay, we'll, yeah, we'll get into that. We'll get into I'll that. present on. <laughs> I'll present on what triggers like interstate commerce, like labeling stuff. What labeling? It, it, I don't want to confuse. Right, right. Yeah. We'll stick on this end. Okay. Um, so ingredients and processes that exempt from formula requirements under 2015-1, again, um, vanilla beans are exempt, but vanilla extract is not. So anytime you use an extract or a syrup or something to that effect, if you use raspberry, but you start, you decide, no, I want to use some raspberry syrup or raspberry extract, that would kick in the formula requirement, uh, even though raspberry itself is actually exempt from formula uh, submittable. But if you start using extractions and syrups, it'll kick in the formula requirement. Also, 51% of the fermentable materials must consist of, con consist of malt or substitutes uh, when using, this, um, when using these uh, products as well. So TTB can still request a formula and sample for analysis at any time even the exempt ingredients are used. So if we just want to see the formula because we're not sure what you're doing, we can just request that information. Say, hey, can we take a look at your formula? Um, you know, and well, labeling does that as well. So if, if, if we need to see the formula, we will validate or verify that you're actually using it, uh, using this stuff properly or, you know, submit the problems. Yeah, go too far. And this is just, this is just a, uh, I guess a snapshot of the actual TTB ruling 2015-1. And this is just the top portion of it. It's just giving you an idea, an example of what it looks like. Agave is on there, allspice, anise, apples, apricots. And it's just giving you kind of description and limitation of each of these ingredients. But that's just a snapshot of the actual document. Combinations of exempt and non-exempt ingredients. So if you decide to use um, exempt and non-exempt ingredients, the formula kicks in. So. If you use guava, but you use the passion fruit and vanilla beans, which are exempt, the guava will kick the formula requirement. Also, we have a formula uh, tool. So if you're unsure what you're doing, 
in the production, you're saying, hey, I'm using these particular ingredients and that sort of thing. We have a formula tool on our webpage, ttv.gov, where you can actually go to the tool and input the information that you're actually doing or the product that you're, you're producing, and it'll tell you exactly uh, if you need to submit a formula or not. It'll say, yeah, you need a formula or no. So th that is a helpful uh, tool to have. So uh, we have it for both. We have it for all three commodities, wine, malt beverages, and the skill spirits. So if you're if you have all three commodities, um, yeah, this is a very useful tool because it does actually aid you in determining if you do the wire form. TTB looks for what we look for when we're actually reviewing uh, these formulas. Have you used the correct designation? For, malt, for beer and malt beverages, it's not a whole lot of different class types that, you know, because the other commodities are a bit more, uh, it's just a lot more class type uh, situations uh, with spirits and wine, but for beer, it's not many. Um, also, what we look for is the ingredients that you're using, we want to make ensure that they're generally recognized as safe. And again, that's an FDA arm, but we kind of act on their behalf uh, when we're reviewing formulas, but we just want to make sure that the ingredients or additives that you're using are generally recognized as safe. Or they have some sort of regulatory uh, site or uh, regulation that actually states they're okay for, for use in food, general food use or specific to alcohol. Ciders? So, oh, you mean you're you're making ciders, cider and wine? You're combining the two of them? No, we're doing just cider. Um, so I don't, I don't know how that. Well, you must have a, you have a, you have you have a blended winery as well, or no? No. Ooh. Okay. We might have to talk about wine. The <laughs> 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 ciders are wine. That's that's wine. That's yeah, a wine. Yeah. We're we're under the farm of the same. But you shouldn't be produced. Well, like I said, I don't want to get into that now. But you shouldn't produce ciders. We don't produce ciders at a at a, at a brewery premise, and that's where the issue will come in. So, but we can talk later on that. But you should have both permits. But I'm sorry. Just a little side note: like New York State allows a farm brewery to also do ciders, but that doesn't mean like yeah, federally. Don't need, but you still right, need federally it's different. So, like so. summarize. <laughs> exactly. So federally, that that's where that's where the issue is going to lie. So you'll probably need to actually apply for a winery permit under the federal law. Yeah. So that's why that's why I said we can get into that later. But once you say cider and, and I'm at the New York <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, so yeah, we'll, we'll we'll talk about that later. But I, yeah, yeah, we can discuss. Um what we all have you used any limited or prohibited ingredients? That's kind of rehashing the same thing. Did you submit the correct supporting documents for certain ingredients? Um yes for for particular ingredients when you're listing the formula out uh, you may either need a spec sheet, a flavor ingredient data sheet, and you should be making use of a limited ingredient calculation worksheet. And we'll get into those as well. Uh, I'll try to get into those more specifically. With respect to the flavor ingredient data sheet, as I mentioned before, typically when, you're, when you need a flavor ingredient data sheet, that means you're buying a flavor from a flavor house. So like I said, you use Flavormatic, Flavor Man, Givadon, Master Taste, whatever the case may be, you want to request that fit sheet from that flavor house. And they should have those fit sheets. So if you say, hey, I'm using the strawberry flavor from Flavormatic, make sure you request that because typically they'll have those because they're familiar with the non-beverage submittal process for the lab. And they will have that fit sheet in hand. So when you submit your formula to us, you'll submit that fit sheet along with your uh, beverage uh, uh, application to us. So make sure you get that flavor ingredient data sheet from the flavor. The fit sheet allows TTB again. We ensure the compound and flavor has been evaluated by the TTB non-beverage product lab. Again, they go through the lab for review. Verify that your beverage does not contain any ingredients of, of excess of the limits, limits prescribed by TTB or FDA. Again, a lot of these compounded flavors that you get from these flavor houses they have a lot of a lot of components, and a lot of them are limited in nature that you can actually add to a beverage product. Vanillin, ethylvanillin, propylene glycol, uh, a number of other things that could be present in that flavor that could impact the label and impact the FDA's guidelines. So make sure uh, when you're adding these these flavors, you make use of the calculation sheet, which I will talk about in a minute. 
uh, also, we want to ensure the appropriate labeling of your product. So um, based off of that, that bid sheet that you're using could impact the statement of compensation that's issued to you because it could render the product, art, well, the non-beverage product or the flavor in, well, artificial or imitation, which would have to come across when you're labeling more beverage with natural flavors or more beverage with artificial flavors, just depending. Some of these flavors have color. Um, you didn't add color directly, but sometimes these, these flavors have colors like certified colors, and caramel color, that sort of thing, that has to come out in that lake on the SOC. All right, so yeah, and again, I, as I mentioned, it ensured that it complies with TTP uh, restrictions governing how alcohol and beverage may be derived from flavors, but, uh, which we just spoke of. Uh, flavor manufacturers supply to the group. Like I suggested, you get that from the flavor house. The flavor house will give you that fit sheet. And again, it's a concentration of limited ingredients, uh, typically in parts per million. Again, list of, list of colors are on there. It also states the alcohol, because most of these flavor, flavors have alcohol uh, in them. Um, yeah, so yeah, that's all I have on this slide, because we kind of went over most of this. So. Anybody have any questions? Go ahead, go ahead. All right, two things real quick. Sure. Uh, what's the name of that list with the exempt ingredients? 2015 1. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Technically speaking, yeah. yeah. Okay, limited ingredients. TTD, uh, these, well, these are limited ingredients that appear on the fish. Uh, synthetic maltol, ethyl maltol, synthetic vanillin, and ethyl vanillin. All, the, all of those are going to be on the top portion of that fit sheet. If they exceed a certain amount, it's going to, it's going to impact the, the non-beverage flavor that you're using. It's going to render the beverage either natural or uh, artificial, depending on the use rate of that flavor in the product, in the finished product. Uh, so uh, we, we'll get more into that. But that's essentially what those are. And those are the only four components on that fit sheet that would actually impact whether that flavor is natural or artificial. Okay, and here's the limited ingredient calculation worksheet. So if you have a series of, of flavors, because a lot of these brewers will have like three or four flavors that they're using in a particular malt beverage, if that's the case, we have a handy dandy limited ingredient calculation worksheet. So you, you input the information the information from the fit sheet in this calculation sheet, and it'll, it'll spit out uh, if you're within the 5149 rule of the amount of alcohol derived from flavors. It will spit out the use rate, based, you know, based off the vanilla levels and that sort of thing, to see if it's actually artificial or uh, natural. So all of those things are actually impactful to the label. So it's good that you make use of these calculation worksheets, and they're on our webpage, uh, ttb.gov. So you can grab those all day as well. And this is the, well, this is with the flavors that contain alcohol. Um, if the final ABV is less than or equal to 6%, at least 51% of the alcohol has to be derived from the from fermentation process. And the other 49% can be derived from the alcohols that are actually contained in the flavors. If, that, if it goes the other way, you have a distilled spirit. So we, we don't want that. And this came about from the, uh, what was it, the flavor malt beverage craze that kicked in maybe 10 or 15 years ago. It was flavor malt beverages were just popping up everywhere. But a lot of times these, these beers at the time were pr primarily flavored. And it was all ethanol, I mean alcohol, distilled alcohol, with very little alcohol derived from malt or, or the fermentation process. So that's kind of where this came from. So that's why this um, was kicked in. And if, if, if your finished product is greater than 6%, no more than 1.5% of the volume of the malt beverage can consist of alcohol derived from flavors. And when you're making use of these, uh, these non-beverage flavors that contain, al contain alcohol, you need to have an alcohol statement on the label, but I'll, I'll let Kay already get into that part of it as well. But if you're using flavors that, that contain alcohol, typically you're going to be required to have an alcohol statement on that. Spec sheets, 
Um, typically, I, and you can read this, but typically I'll, I'll request a spec sheet from an industry member when they're actually pulling something off the grocery store shelves or they're not really purchasing anything from a flavor house. They'll say, hey, Mike, I'm using Welch's grape juice. Welch's grape juice is kind of natural. There aren't a whole lot of things in Welch's grape juice that I will have a lot of concern with. So typically I will allow it, but I will want that ingredient list. So you just kind of take a snapshot of the ingredient list. Hey, Mike, I'm using Welch's grape. You know, this is what I'm using. Can you, you know, let me know if this is okay. I'll reach back out to you if it's fine. You know, if, if it's fine, I'll just give you approval if I need additional information, uh, which that, that could be a problem because a lot of times if you're using something off the store shelves, you can't get that information because you, know, you just don't have, that's not available to you. Um, so hopefully when you're pulling stuff off of these shelves and you're using juices out of there, it's pretty, a ba it's a basic list of ingredients. If it's a basic list of ingredients on that, on that label, typically we'll let you go ahead and go with it. But if not, and I have additional questions, you may want to find a different route. Uh, this is either just talking about the compound of versus versus versus. Okay, so FDA requirements. Um, I don't like to get too heavy into FDA stuff because I don't like to speak on behalf of the FDA, even though I talk to them like weekly, daily at times. Um, but any additive that we have questions about, we contact the FDA. And ultimately, it's their decision to allow or not allow it. Sometimes if it's not, if, if it doesn't have a generally recognized and safe a designation or it doesn't have a regulation associated with it, sometimes they'll give us information back saying, hey, you don't have any safety concerns with this particular ingredient, let them use it, it's fine. So they'll use their discretion to allow certain ingredients that don't have any kind of backing, regulatory-wise or with a grass notification. So if you have some, because a lot of these, a lot of folks are actually trying to get some sort of niche into the marketplace. And when you do that, I know a lot of times you're making use of ingredients that are they're not traditional or everyday type ingredients. If that's the case, you want to use some herbs or some, some exotic fruits, make sure you just give me a call, shoot me an email, say, hey, Mike, I want to use these ingredients. Are these okay? What I'll do is I'll vet them through the FDA if I don't already have the information, and I'll get it back to you. That's probably the easiest way. I don't want you to spin your wheels and you start you know, testing and producing or whatever, whatever you're doing. And you can't produce it because I just told you that's dangerous. That's, that's a prohibited item. So just make sure if you're using something like that, uh, just reach out to me prior to. Any other questions on that? Done. And generally recognized as safe, uh, again, that's, that's just a designation. Typically, typically a brewer wouldn't submit a, a, a grass notification. It'll be submitted by like an attorney who actually does this every day. So if you're using a particular ingredient, you're probably gonna have to hire somebody to submit a grass notification to the FDA to get that clear. Uh, but again, it, that takes sometimes years to get grass notifications clear. So if you see something that could be potentially, uh, uh, you know, it's going, it, it may take a while, and I know time is money, and money is time. You may want to, you know, go a different route because it's no need on sitting sitting on something that may take a year or so. Uh, and it's just more FDA information where they maintain prohibited items. There is a list of prohibited ingredients, a calamus. I think calamus is on the list. Certain ingredients that can't be used in food in general. You just can't use it in food. Um, and the, and of course they have non non prohibited items as well on those lists. Uh, but again, that's under part uh, CFR 21, uh, and it's a series of different locations where uh, those ingredients are allowed or disallowed. Uh, how do I apply for a formula? We have a online submittal process. We, I, I don't, I, we may get, I don't even know if we get paper anymore. If we get paper, it may be 0.5% of the total submissions. I don't even know if it even registers at this point. So everything is automated. Um, and we have a formula online customer, customer page. It's a, it's, it's a very good system because it gives you guidance, step-by-step uh, -step guidance. It validates all of the, the, the items that you input into the system, uh, and it gives you updates with your formula via email. So those are the benefits to it. Um, also, if you need to apply for formulas online or register for formulas online, Tracy Holden is the registrar. She works for my team. Um, so if you need that, again, I can give you that information before you leave. If you aren't registered, uh, funnel, we call it funnel, but it's Formulas Online System. Uh, and I can get you connected to her so she can get you registered for Formulas Online. 
uh, formulas going on, helpful hints. Supply a quantitative list of ingredients. A lot of folks don't like providing specifics on the ingredient list. We deal with 6103 tax information all day. We won't share this information. What I would just suggest you do, just give me your recipe, let me know exactly what you're doing. It makes things easier. A lot of people are a bit more a bit resistant to that. No need, it's just, it's tax information. We can't share it if we wanted to. I probably wouldn't be like this podium if I was sharing 6103 information. So, but again, indicate the state, uh, at what stage your flavors are being added to the product. So if you're adding a, a flavor, at fermentation or post-fermentation, whatever you decide, it's good to know those things because a lot of times um, the SOC or the statement of composition that I issue to you will be contingent upon when you're adding these flavors, what it used to be, what kind of used to be. Now we're kind of a little bit more liberal with that, but in the past we would want you to tell us exactly when you're adding uh, flavors to the product because it impacted the SOC because you had more beverage brewed with banana or more beverage with banana added. So it's two different nuances to it. Essentially, you're adding natural flavors to it, but we used to differentiate between those two practices, if that makes sense. Again, provide a common name, a scientific name for uh, unusual herb, herbs or spices or what have you, or fruits or that sort of thing. Uh, it would be great to have the genus and species when you submit it to me. That way I can get an idea of exactly what you're using. Uh, ensure the ingredients are considered grass. I don't know if you would know if they were grass, so unless you go to the FDA's webpage. They have a, a ton of grass notifications that are approved, but most grass notifications are specific to the use. So it may be a grass notification for a particular ingredient that's only for beer or only for alcohol. So you gotta be, I mean, for distilled spirits. So you have to be clear. So you say, hey Mike, I got a grass notification for this ingredient, uh, no, grass notification 341, and I read it, and I'm, it's for wine only. So just make sure when you're going through these grass lists that it's specific or it's a general grass notification. So be, be sure that you're looking at the right information. And these are formula resources. Um, and if anybody needs the presentation, I can share that with you as well. But this is just a list, list of resources for you guys, um, uh, just in case you have any questions. Uh, but again, I'll leave, I have my card, you can call me direct. That's probably the easiest way. But again, I think that's it for me. Uh, yeah, so. Any questions for anybody? No, yes, no. Hi, everyone. My name is Carrie Flores, um, also a supervisor like Mike over at CCB in DC. Um, so, can I just take a quick poll? Like, how many people are first time label submitters? I just kind of want to know where to focus. Okay, so about six. Okay. Um, and others are well seasoned. Are, is there any compliance officers in the room or anything? Okay. I guess I'll, I'll tailor maybe into like more basic. Um, but, you know, feel free to intervene and stop me uh, as we go along because some of it might be too basic. Just so you all know, this slideshow originally is like a 90 minute slideshow that we like micro condensed. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that didn't make it. So if you have a question that's like not in the slides, um, Mike and I are tabling outside after. Um, and you can come see us if you have questions and I'll stuff that's on the slides, like gluten, allergens, all that. Like we just have, we didn't have time to go through this. It's only have like 25 minutes. So like I said, originally this was at a craft brewers conference for almost 90 minutes. Um, all right, so let's begin. And um, like I said, this is a stone review. One important piece of information is um, effective today, so March 11, 2022, um, we had a bread modernization of that first. So that means like, we have breads, right? Implementing breads that, that dictate the formulation requirements. So the regs change very early. It's very hard to, very difficult to change the law. Um, and when, when you do change, when the agency decides to change, they have to go out and notice the we have to solicit for a period of months. Hey, industry, hey, public, you know, hey, whoever, like, please comment on what you think our program is. Are. And so, it's been ten years, I believe, in different phases when we finally are uh, publishing phase two of our regulatory changes. Um, the most important change I would say for the people who are today are the distinction of brand label is one way. Meaning, when you are submitting a label to us, a very common correction was always like, hey, you're missing mandatory and optional pieces of information mm -hmm. um, off your brand label. So we would send back a lot of corrections, 
to the industry, to brewers, saying, you're missing this on your brand label, you're missing this on your brand label, um, your net content is incorrect on your brand label, um, uh, you know, let's say your ABP is uh, in the incorrect format or whatever. Well, now that the brand label distinction is gone, and again, that's just part of the efforts, that's a liberalization effort to reduce the personal industry, those corrections should go away, but the mandatory information is still remains. It just can now be on the label, back, front, whatever. Um, so that's, that's good news for today, and that's something I know um, Janelle, our PR person, really wanted me to emphasize today, so that's what I'm doing. Um, um, and that kind of, this is just me summarizing that right there. Um, uh, but the good news, again, it doesn't require any changes to your existing practice. It's a liberalization. Okay, so we're going to go into mandatory label information, and that's kind of the easiest way. Your mindset is like, there's two parts of the label. Mandatory label information and option. And what triggers what is something we'll get into in a second. Um, so brand name, brand name is simply like, when you market the projects, you know, like there's slides on this, um, but, you know, let's just say you're just not going to feel like creative. Like the brand name can be your company name. You know, I see it all the time. Um, alcohol content, this is kind of just segueing into like Mike's presentation. Alcohol content is is um, not mandatory. And it is mandatory, it's triggered when, let's say you use an ingredient that has added alcohol. Most common would be like vanilla extract or a compound flavoring or uh, that's just one term of art, but manufacturer flavor. Like let's say you're making animal popcorn flavor and you know that it has a certain amount of ethanol, you know, you're gonna need alcohol. Um, so basically, like, if you want to remember one day, like, when do I need alcohol content on my label? Ask yourself, am I adding the ingredient that contains added alcohol? Do not add fresh flavor. Some of the things that might go over. But think it, you can't think of anything, vanilla extract, for sure. Um, also, something important to note, too, is again, in the slides, we didn't have time, but there is a concept called allowable revisions. And it is something where, like, you can change the alcohol content. After market. So after you get approval from us, you know, we stamp it, um, you can come back and, and you don't have to submit it back to TTV, you can change the outcome content. Okay. It's called a allowable revision and you can go on TTV.gov and there's an allowable revision like engine, it has little drop downs and you can like play around with like what is an allowable revision. But basically, you know, the feds want to see um, that you're not adding any text, because that's the thing that we have to see. If something we've already seen, like alcohol content, and you're just changing the numbers, like that's less important. But yeah, you're not gonna basically be able to like just willy-nilly like replace an entire piece of the buffer or whatnot. We're gonna wanna see it at the base, but um, deleting and revising existing text is more where long revision sit, not just adding entire paragraphs. Um, but again, that's a time saver because in, in running business, you know, and it's also a time saver in our end too, efficiency-wise. If we don't have to see it, we'd rather not see it. We have you know, process like 100,000 plus like a year. And there's only, my team, there's six people in the entire country that do this full time. So it's not like there's, you know, room of like 100,000. So that's something that reduces burden on your end and our end. And again, um, it's a time saver. So that's for alcohol content. Name and address can simply be your city and state. It doesn't have to, you know, it doesn't have to be your suite number on there, your street address can be on there. I know that label space is a premium. You don't have to put your, uh, Crazy long street name or video box or whatever. Just put your city and state. Um, net contents. So, net contents for Hall Beverage is very interesting because, um, unlike wine and spirits, like a lot of insurers call me and they have permits for all three and they get confused. I'll conflate like the net contents that's on what they see in wine, which is the MLs, and uh, you know, they will bring the MLs over into the Hall Beverage world. It is not that, it is English units. Well, there'll be a chart that you'll see in a second that will describe that, but again, I'm trying to do quick terms of same ways. Net contents is different, and it's not MLs. You can certainly put MLs on your label, but it can't be the only thing. Um, and then class, classifies as, you know, your lager, your filter, you know, stout, plug, and all that. Um, it has to have something on there. You can't just say, uh, what's it called? A common error I see, people just miss the class entirely, so uh, they'll just put half the that, that, you know, that be, that's a style, but it's not a by the recognized in terms of our regulations to classify. So you might just say like, or so another product would be like more under, there'd be like nothing but that. It's like, no, you need to, you need to add the word ale or stout or pills or whatever you want to add, but it has to have something. It has to buy as minimal under on its own, for example, is not sufficient. Um, 
And then government health warning is actually, um, it's different regulations, part 16. Um, you're gonna hear part seven a lot, that's just a section of the regulations we're in. Part 16 is uh, uh, a different part of the regulations and uh, it is very prescriptive. It's one of the few regulations that it is to a T. Copy and paste, you can't go wrong with your copy and paste. I've seen some insane errors. Um, some of them are funny, like, you know, Sturgeon General, you know, like, you know, or, you know, people will mess up the capitalization or they won't hold it correctly. Um, you know, reduce the risk on your end, copy and paste. And again, if that doesn't, you know, it can also be branded and boss blown, you know, all that on, on, onto the article. Um, and then uh, ingredient declarations. For, for, for brewers, it's very rare that I see so far declarations. Um, I have never seen the aspartame declaration on the label. It, I'm not saying it could happen, but uh, if you are going to opt to do that, then make sure you follow our progress on that. And again, FTC yellow is probably the most missed, uh, I think, item. Um, if you're going to be using that color material, then make sure it is on the label. And we'll get into that in a second. So that's the brief, you know, 10 second overview um, of what's to follow, basically. So again, we'll start with the government warning statement, um, or excuse me, general requirements. Um, readily legible. You roll up on a product, it's the first thing you notice. You know, should, that's, that's the standard. Like, you, you, you basically immediately notice it. Um, you, or you take the, you know, the product and you like flip it, you know, like, or is it, is it like a silver on white font? Like, no. <laughs> no one can read that. Um, so, yeah, contrasting background, again, you know, if you're trying to be edgy, uh, just watch it because sometimes you'll find yourself contravening the regs because no one can read it. And it might be cool and remarkable, but um, at the end of the day, if someone can't, it's not really legible and it's not going to be a department. Um, and then uh, uh, brand name must be in English, and of course, there's an exception for those products, consumer work. And then uh, there are uh, size requirements, so I think it's like uh, more familiar. There's this is in the regs, again, very restrictive. It tells you exactly the size of. Uh, what needs to be seen. Uh, it's almost exactly you know, for government warning statement specifically. Mm -hmm. uh, and then of course this link right here, um, let's just say you're really busy. Um, so I, ha I have the rigs here and like if you, if you take them they're like only, they're only like 10 pages. Um, like these are all the rigs that I'm going over today. But let's just say that you um, are looking for like a more plain language resource. Um, it's still the rigs, but more I guess in like a bite sized way, bite sized kind of way. Like, it. It's called the BAM, <coughs> like the alcohol manual. You might hear brewers say, like, I looked at the BAM, I looked at the BAM. Um, again, it's the ranks, just in a condensed version, and maybe a little bit more plain language, but that's like, again, if you're busy, read it. But I suggest one of parts of the ranks uh, first, um, if you can. Uh, and then in the link, that's on ttv.gov. So this is uh, just an example of mandatory label um, information. Uh, like, I guess, a visual rendering, let's call it. Um, so, so brand name, like, you know, right here, example, example you. Uh, name and address, like I said, city, state, submission, code of mind, uh, class of type, you know, both the nail number, you know, if you're wondering what that means, uh, have wise and like, on its own would be sufficient. It's got to be ale, beer, closer, or locker, south, uh, small beverage, uh, those are the opposite options. Um, that contents of it again, we use English in this, uh, so it's not going to be analyzed. And there's a triggering point at one point, which you'll see in a chart in a moment. And the government warning, like I said, can be branded and bossed and all that. Again, common errors are not capitalizing, according, and consumption. Putting the word heavy in here is operate machinery, not heavy machinery. And then instead of an or, people put in sometimes. Um, and of course, not holding appropriately. So this is just very solid, just copy and paste that. So I don't avoid a lot of spending. Um, so I'll just leave it up for a second so you can absorb it. But like I said, the slides are available on ttv.com as well as I think um, the New York State. They're Yeah. And then, okay, so again, this is just me going over brand name. It's what, what is your product market at, uh, under? And then you can simply use your company name, like I said, if you're just feeling uncreative. <laughs> and then, um, you know, like when you are um, filling out your application, because there's, there's, like I said, there's other errors, like a mandatory and optional information. 
But we can go even further and say that there's application errors and then the actual label errors, and that they feed into each other. So, for example, you're filling out the um, application, also known as a COLA, stands for a certificate of uh, label approval. Um, for short, COLA application, um, some people will just put the class and type instead of their brand name. Just like you know, you're busy and you're, you're rushing, it's easy to swap these pieces of information out. Just take the time to be like, oh, my brand name is um, not beer. <laughs> um, I mean, if it was something like Sam's beer, you know, maybe, but um, stuff like this is a, is a common error I see. Just trying to again, educate you and save yourself some time and headache and submit something that has your company name or your marketing name. And then again, for other pieces, I'll show you here. Um, okay, name and address. Same thing, an application, people will put the wrong state and state. Maybe you have multiple locations, you totally forget. Um, what's happening, and you, you upload the wrong permit or you fill out the wrong city. Again, another common error for name and address. Um, again, so uh, city is a bottler. You know, in most cases for brewers, um, it, they're the same entity. So you're bottling and producing. Um, but I, I say that because first of all, people get confused. They're like, okay, well, I'm the producer, I'm doing this and this, and I'm contract growing. It can get very confusing. <coughs> You're in a very complicated contract growing arrangement. Please email me and we can work through it. Um, principal place of business. Look, so there's a couple options of oh, name and address. Uh, for example, um, if, you are, if you are growing under multiple locations, uh, you can just simply put your principal place of business. Again, it's, it's a, you know, let's, let's say you have 12 plants. Like, who has that kind of legal space? Um, just use your principal place of business, unless you can, you can fit all of that on the label. Um, and then, or you can, uh, like maybe you only have two locations, you want to put both for marketing reasons, go ahead. Okay, but it's either or. Um, and then uh, the last bullet just simply says, uh, uh, you can also, the place of bottling. Again, that's for most brewers, the producer is a bottler, and, and, and crafters. Um, again, it, we, we just went over this common mistakes. Uh, City and state only do not match. Uh, just take the time again you know, to make sure you, you uploaded the right permit for multiple locations because it will, I think, it auto populates your city and state you know, or add. Um, if you want to add two locations, make sure that in, in your application the box has both permits loaded. Okay? Um, and then um, the, the last bullet here is again for uh, a lot of contract growing errors. Contract growing can be very confusing. Um, for example, I'll give you an example, like to say, yeah, Brewed and bottled by X brewer under special agreement in X city by so and so. When I say contract brewing, um, I think people sometimes get confused with collaborations too. Let's say you have a buddy brewer, you're in Brooklyn, you know, and your your collaboration brewing with Houston, uh, someone in Houston. Um, make sure your name and address isn't misleading. That's another error that I see because you'll be you know collabing, and you guys call each other out and stuff. But the location, let's just say you're actually bottling in Brooklyn and you're just you may be the person in Houston just gave some rest of the business. Collaboration is very popular. Um, um, maybe they just suggest a hop variety for you to use whatever you just call your friend out. So make sure you, you don't throw the Houston um, address on your label like it came from it. Because that's gonna be an error we're gonna say this is misleading but this actually is should be more Brooklyn emphasized. Um, that's a common error I see too and again collaboration breaks are very popular. And just something to note um, when you're doing that kind of stuff. And okay, so this is the chart about the net contents. Um, again, if you remember nothing, just remember that um, pint is for triggers. So if you have a label and you're, it says 16 fluid ounces and it's nothing else, that's not correct. It would have to say pint, and then from there it goes into into these. Uh, and so a common error I see is a bomber size is, you know, 22 fluid ounces. Um, it would be 1.6 fluid ounces, okay? Um, I think that's the most most common error. Um, sometimes with cake haulers too, um, you can use decimal points. So you can submit a cake hauler uh, submission. Uh, you can you can simply say 7.16. Yeah, that's fine, that's fine. Um, but if you're trying to get creative, like if you, let's say you're, um, I've had a team label where they might just say something like kind of random, like 10 Perkins. No, gotta <laughs> revisit the chart, right? 
Um, and then, yep, common mistakes, like I said, you know, standing six people in ounces, so you're staring at your label and you're like, I'm ready to submit this, and you're like, I only see six people in ounces. No, I don't know. Um, and then, um, but you can certainly say, so that this is not me saying you can't have it on there, you can have it on there, but you also have to think I need the inventory. So you can have both. Let's say you have, you want to have ML because a lot of your clients are here, like maybe they just or something. And you, you feel like they would be more familiar with ML, so leave it on there. But also have the um, pipe. And again, that, that's a, uh, we use English units versus my favorite units. Why? It's just it's just a regular work, just a regular, a regular work. Um, and I think the original statute was published in 1935, like post-prohibition. So there's some old-timey language and some leftover stuff um, about this kind of stuff. And I and I know that it has been some topic of conversation, like hey, can we um, change that content to work on beverage? And again, that would have to be a rulemaking project that would take, you know, notice and comment, you go out to the public, and it would just it would take like at least it's, it takes a long time to, 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 um, to update the regular space, sometimes decades. Um, so if they were going to do that, I think it would it'd be quite some time. But for now, uh, you can have both. Um, alcohol by volume, again, uh, just to reemphasize what Mike said as well, um, common misconception in the brewing industry is, okay, I need to have a label. And again, we had to cut the slides way down, but we get you back a little bit. A question people have is, why do I even need a label from the feds? Well, um, okay, so if you're entering interstate commerce, you have to have a label with the federal government. So you have to GTP, you'll have to approve the label if you're entering interstate commerce. And also, and also if your product has multiple garlic and hops, okay? It's a two-prong, um, and there's also something called similar state law, but again, it's mostly a two-prong uh, situation. So ask yourself, am I making a product using multiple barley hops? Am I entering interstate commerce? Yes, I believe in cola. Um, and so, I'm just going this. Oh yeah, so you, you, you established that you need a cola, right? Now, at the same time, what's happening, what I was thinking back in my point, is uh, people then go, well, okay, wait a minute. I'm only selling in New York. I'm selling in trust state, like in within the state borders. Um, I don't need a formula for So if the two things are totally divorced from each other. So a formula requirement, it doesn't matter. Regardless if you're selling in state or out of state or whatever, uh, you need a formula. But you need to step aside and then the labeling side, you're like, okay, interstate commerce, multi barley hops, I need a goal. But that that logic does not apply to formula. And that makes sense. If you step back and think about it, it makes sense because food safety is food safety. Like, why would why would you be exempt from food safety just because you're selling? You only want to poison people in the state that you live in. Like, that doesn't that logic that doesn't really hold, right? So, um, it got to the point where we were so confused. And you know, I, uh, Mike and I we go to the crack voting conferences a lot. Uh, <coughs> the agency made an FAQ. So uh, if you go to TCP.gov, you'll see an FAQ. And it'll just say, um, it talks about, hey, we're going to farm. And it clarifies, it doesn't matter if you're entering interstate commerce or farm. Um, and that this was all triggered with a trend where people were going into the grocery store and um, throwing in baked goods and donuts and breakfast cereals. I don't know if I remember this breakfast cereal trend for a little bit. Might still be going. Uh, or brewers were just walking into the grocery store and they're getting inspired by the fruity pebbles or whatever and, and, and making. Um, breakfast ales or fruity pebbles, whatever, or um, Oreo style ales, you know, okay. no one knows. They still do. They still do. The dessert themed stuff and the breakfast cereal stuff was a, a huge trend a few years ago, and it seems to be still around, but not as like not as much. Well, that trend drove a bunch of people, again, to misunderstand the formula side. Because they were like, well, okay, I'm using fruity pebbles or whatever. And, but I'm not selling outside of uh, I'm not selling outside of Illinois, so I'm good. We, and then now we have a serious problem because people are just you know just dumping stuff in and they're, they're mixing interstate commerce requirements. 
that pertains to policy. If you need a, a label, it's interstate commerce. Formula, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if you're just selling down on your, the same street if you're, if you're, if you're like, there's sometimes I'll get calls from brewers who are like, oh, I only sell locally. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Um, so, um, oh, yes. Hi. We're a brewery that produces uh, beer. It sells just in-house cakes only. So cake powder. Uh, do we need a cola and do we need uh, formula? Um, we're only selling in -house. No, you don't, if you're not selling interstate, is it multi barley hops? That's what it's a product that okay. Um, no, you don't need a cola. But if your formula triggered, we'll get into that slide in a second. Your formula would be triggered um, if you're using a product that is an ingredient that is not exempted. Or is a flavoring or coloring material. Okay. That might be one of those. <coughs> so yeah. So you wouldn't need a cola. I mean, unless you are venturing on a state, you also need the definition of cola. <laughs> um, so I know I'm running out of time here. Uh, so um, another brand change that was recent was for many, many years alcohol by weight uh, wasn't allowed. It was allowed on other um, commodities, meaning like spirits and uh, like there's just, um, but it's not very used. It's, not, it's just not used, but um, for some reason, the regs were localized without it. I do see sometimes uh, foreign countries, like imported products, will have ABW on the label. But if you are going to opt in for um, using alcohol content, or if it's mandatorily triggered for you, then make sure you write, use the right format. So uh, acronyms alone are not sufficient. Um, common error, again, going back to what I said earlier, is uh, it's no longer revision. So that means if you want to change the outcome from later, use the recipe, whatever, and ferment the next version, then uh, you don't need to submit that label to us simply because you need to revise the outcome. Um, common error is missing for symbol, and again, um, missing alcohol content. All together. Um, health warning statement, again, totally copy and paste this. Make sure it's separate and apart. Don't bury it in your marketing offering. Um, again, because that wouldn't be the part of being a professional. Uh, sometimes, like, again, edginess is a problem sometimes. If I understand the marketing uh, need, but it needs to be separate and apart. It needs to be readily legible, and um, it needs to be on a contrast with everything. All right, 
so um, glass type, again, uh, this is a specialty products. This is the stuff that is formulated. There's only two options with small beverages. If you are flavoring your product, you're either a 2015 F1 product, which you might be saying is under the rolling, or you are formulated. There's no other option. And this is an include sea salt, and I chose sugar. Okay. It's a fruit, or a spice, or a nut. It's going to be one of those two. Yeah, I think we're out of time. We're out of time. Mm -hmm. <laughs>